Hi all, welcome to the Jenkins Developer uh, webinar. Today is uh, May 18th and we have James North who will present uh, plugin form 4.0 and the changes in that. Before that I will uh, do a really quick opening and then we will press it with the technical content. Okay, do you see my screen? Yeah, uh, so quick introduction uh, to the Jenkins online meetup. Um, okay, we are doing regular sessions for Jenkins users, uh, Jenkins developers, and uh, the main objective is to share any kind of experiences for developer meetups or what is by contributors for contributors. So basically we do a really relaxed uh, discussion. Uh, the main focus is to do show and tell and live demos. Um, and everybody is welcome to participate, to ask questions. We are ready to unmute you if you want to ask questions. Actually, it's our first developer uh, meetup, which we do in a Zoom webinar. If it doesn't work, we will switch back to Zoom. And yeah, thanks to our sponsors, uh, Continuous Delivery Foundation and CloudBees, which provide us uh, uh, equipment and other things uh, to get uh, these uh, webinars running. Uh, so, as I said, everybody is welcome to participate, and if you are just starting contributing to Jenkins, or if you're interested to do so, we have a good uh, page uh, on the Jenkins IO website, which uh, describes uh, various ways to contribute. So, if you're interested uh, to do any kind of contribution, like uh, submit some code, or maybe participate in design, participate in documentation, please refer to this page. And uh, there is also a good opportunity to contribute next week because we are starting a uh, UI UI Hackfest. Hack it will be a week long event uh, where everybody just works on user interface, documentation, or shares experiences about Jenkins. And good news is that uh, at the end of this event, you can get special schwag and prizes. Um, so if you're interested, uh, there is an online page for that on the uh, Jenkins IO website. We are still working on a final list of uh, project ideas. Um, but there is a number of uh, good areas, um, and uh, if you're a plugin maintainer, uh, you're also welcome to propose uh, stories uh, related to your plugins. If you want to work on something specific, again, uh, please uh, feel free to do so. It's not a hackathon, it's really a hack fest, and everybody is welcome uh, to contribute on uh, any stories which would uh, improve for Jenkins user experience. Okay, and we can talk a bit more about uh, it later. And yeah, I'll just finish the slides. So if you're interested to present anything related to plugin development or development in general, it can be best practices like how to do static code analysis or how to properly deliver code with Java or with Jenkins, uh, please let us know. We are looking for speakers as for anything else. For this particular meetup, again, it's a developer meetup, so we will be adding everyone uh, uh, panelists or granting voice permissions so that you can ask questions. Uh, James, what's your preference? Would you like to get questions during the presentation or after that? Sorry, just had to find the unmute button. Um, okay. I, I don't mind. Um, I work okay with interruptions during a meeting. Um, if, if you want to save them till the end as well, I've, I've got a section at the mm. end for, for Q&A. Um, whatever mm. the person feels happy with. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, and yeah, for offline, uh, we have Jenkins developer mailing list. We have a number of chats where you can ask. And uh, also, we will be sending our feedback form uh, just to collect some additional details. So everyone uh, um, is uh, welcome to attend. And I guess uh, that's it from me. So please welcome uh, James North, uh, who will uh, do the presentation itself. Okay. Um, are you going to monitor for questions during? Because I presume everyone's muted by default then. Uh, I am muted everyone, and uh, yep. uh, if you just uh, join or if you cannot ask a question, uh, please uh, use a Zoom Q&A or chat and uh, we will handle that. Cool. Okay, uh, can you see my slide correctly? Does that come through? Yes, we can. Okie dokie. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the um, plugin parent POM uh, 4.0 and later and what that means uh, to you as a plugin developer, what you need to do and why we actually went about and changed it. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm a 
principal software engineer at Cloudbees, um, working on a commercial product built on top of Jenkins. Um, I work in a team that is responsible for over 50 plugins. Um, so every time we had to change something, and if you look after one or two plugins in open source, um, you can kind of scale that up to 50, and we, we probably hit all of the issues uh, much more frequently. So a lot of that was the driving force for trying to um, address all the problems. So I um, mentioned some problems, um, but kind of let's uh, just explain what they were, so why we actually tried to do um, what we did. Um, I think the biggest um, pain that we all face is uh, every time we change the Jenkins version, you will find five million um, dependency errors caused by uh, something requiring a lower version or a higher version than what is actually included. So something wants to use Commons Codec 1.9, something else wants to use 1.12, you end up using the 1.9, um, and then that can cause issues um, just when running your unit test with things not working correctly, um, or kind of at runtime, the worst case is you, you bundle a library and that conflicts with something else in a different plugin um, that's expecting something to come from core, um, has an optional dependency on your plugin and then doesn't. Um, we have uh, deprecated tooling in the plugin POM. So the Gmaven plugin reached end of life and wasn't actively developed. Um, there was a few issues with it that obviously were never going to get fixed. Um, fine bugs and the fine bugs Maven plugin had been inactive for two, two plus years. Um, if you were new to Jenkins plugin development um, and you knew Maven but not Jenkins plugin, um, we'd quite often confuse you. Um, we'd use um, a, a flag that was set in Maven. Um, for example, skip tests is commonly used to skip running unit tests in the Maven Surefire plugin. Um, but if you did that in a Jenkins plugin, it also wouldn't run your fine bugs analysis and it also wouldn't create any Java doc. So say you wanted to create a bundle quickly to give to someone which had Java doc and everything else, running MVM package D skip tests, you would expect that to happen, but it didn't. Um, another way that we would confuse you is if you wanted to run multiple tests in parallel, you would specify that with concurrency. Um, but Surefire already has a way of doing that and it's called fork count. So all we did when you set concurrency was to then set fork count. Um, but if you knew fork count existed and you tried to set it, it just wouldn't work as expected. So we had a barrier of entry um, to those that knew Maven. Um, if you didn't know Maven, there was a little bit of a barrier of entry because your Google searches would tell you how to do something in Maven. And then when you use the plugin POM, it would actually behave slightly different. Um, and kind of, I think there's something that was a little bit, um, it was a great intention, um, but uh, unfortunately it had a lot of um, bad consequences, was um, the plugin POM allowed you to do bad practices. Um, so if you wrote a flaky test or were still flaky production code, um, the the unit test would actually run five times. So if it failed the first time, it would run it again and again and again up to five times. And it would only fail the build if the unit test failed five times in a row. Um, so this had a couple of things. It, it allows obviously flaky tests and flaky production code to come in. Um, nobody really looks at the output in the console a lot. So the fact that you'd introduce some flaky tests or flaky production code would go missed. And it allowed race conditions to be accepted as the norm because they just weren't, they weren't spotted. And uh, last but least, uh, not least, um, there was some unused and untested complexity, complexity in the POM. Um, so since uh, Jenkins 2.54, 254, um, it has required Java 8 to run. So there is no need to really build any plugin with Java 7. You can build them all with Java 8 if you're targeting anything not ancient. 
Um, and if you are targeting something ancient, then you don't really need to update the, the um, plugin parent. Um, the JGit, um, if anyone are aware of JGit, it is a Java implementation of Git um, provided by Eclipse. Um, and it used or had a profile for using JGit as an SCM as opposed to using the native Git tool when performing releases. Um, and I don't think I've ever come across any need of any plugin doing that. Um, so almost everyone has got a Git installed. Um, I'd be surprised if it even still worked. Um, so I said before in Cloudbees, I had uh, 50 plugins across the team. Um, as part of those tests, um, every week when a new LTS comes out, we have automated jobs that rebuild all of our plugins on the latest master against the latest um, uh, Jenkins Weekly. And it does that by kind of passing in the uh, Jenkins.version, um, which you can do on the command line. So mvn-d Jenkins.version equals whatever we've just released that Friday um, test. And more often than not, we would find we were being hit by um, not actual production code is issues, but the the library conflicts and issues. Um, so rather than actually finding issues in the latest LTS or incompatibilities, uh, sorry, incompatibilities in the weeklies with our plugins, we just ended up finding, oh, there's another library conflict, there's another library conflict. And there was more false positives um, than there were real positives. So, um, having gone through some of the uh, problems, what what were the actual solutions? Um, the biggest one and the one that took a while to actually get right was introducing a bill of materials for Jenkins core. Um, so a bill of materials allows you to, uh, with Maven, define a set of artifacts and their versions and you can define that in a project and then you can consume that in all other projects. Um, so uh, it's quite common to do it with Spring if you're used to using a, a building a Spring Boot um, project. You can just import the Spring Boot um, bill of materials and then all of the Spring libraries and their dependencies will be set to the correct version for the version of Spring Boot that you are targeting. Um, so the bomb was first introduced in Jenkins 2.195. Um, and because we actually want people to be able to use the uh, plugin POM um, without having to go to, at the time, the most recent and weekly, we still needed people to be able to target um, older LTS releases. Um, we specially published um, old versions on all the LTS lines going back to 2.164.1. Um, we still have a few core libraries missing. So Commons Codec um, was a notable one that's missed and there's a PR to add those um, and all other outstanding libraries um, into the latest weekly. Um, and it's not just uh, plugin development where the bomb comes in handy. Um, so the Jenkins file runner or the jar, uh, the Jenkins wire packager um, also benefit from just having a core bomb. Um, so the find bugs, um, given it was dead, that was switched over to spot bugs. Um, any property in the POM that was using find bugs was changed to spot bugs. And the exclusion filter was renamed as well. Excuse me. Um, and one thing to note here is um, if you're targeting a, a recent Jenkins core, so probably one that's gone in in I think the last four weeks, um, all the use of JSR 305 annotations um, have been removed. So it's now um, almost uh, in its entirety only using the spot bugs annotations. There are a couple of annotations from NetJSIP. Um, but they are in the minority. Um, the Gmaven plugin was switched over to Gmaven Plus, um, only really applicable if you're using Groovy uh, compilation 
or, or tests as part of your plugin. Um, I haven't been on any of my plugins, so I can't really add anything here, uh, unfortunately. Um, but it has been tested by someone that has been using Gmaven. The uh, standard Maven properties uh, have now been switched over to using, so there is no more concurrency in in the uh, POM. It's now uh, using fork count. So if you find a Maven property um, documented in kind of a Maven plugin or anywhere else on the web in a plugin that we use, setting its property should take precedence over anything else. Um, skip tests um, now only skips tests. Um, that does have a downside um, and one of the downsides for having that is if you wanted a quick build and people did use skip test for hey, this is a quick build because I don't care about the production quality of it um, you now no longer have that by just using skip tests so because of that um, we introduced a new profile um, so if you actually want a quick build of just build up a HPI so I can run it. Um, there's a profile quick build. So MVN-P quick build, um, that will give you a build, um, or obviously package at the end of that. Um, that will kind of build up the HPI and anything else um, that would produce a final artifact, but skipping anything that does not affect the outcome of the final artifact. So um, the enforcer rules will be skipped, uh, spot bugs will be skipped, unit tests won't be run. Um, if you use the Maven invoker to run some um, extra tests, they will be skipped. Um, the access modifier checker will be skipped. Um, so um, now we've kind of gone through all of that. Um, it's kind of like, okay, what do you need to do? Um, so the first thing you need to do is obviously use it. So update your parent to 4.2. Um, 4.2 is, is the latest today. So it's always best to go with the latest rather than the 4.0. A couple of things have been tweaked and fixed and some libraries and plugins have been updated as well. Yeah, if you have specified your Jenkins version, um, you will need to change your Jenkins version. The default in 4.2 is 2.204. Um, I said earlier, you can use anything from 2.164.1 um, through all the LTSs or any weekly from 2.195. Um, bit more manual work is any version that you've specified in dependency management or dependencies that is now coming from the bomb should be removed. Um, this is, is legwork. You have to kind of go into the bomb, um, have a look at the dependencies. Um, it, it's specifying there for all the artifacts and see if you've declared them. If you have, safely delete it. Um, if you have declared them in the dependency section as opposed to dependency management section and are using Eclipse, um, Eclipse will tell you you're overriding a managed dependency, so you can just remove it. Um, if it's in dependency management, um, Eclipse doesn't help you. Um, I've not seen anything in IntelliJ, but I don't use IntelliJ um, day to day, so I might be missing something. James, so yeah. so forgive the injection. You said you're okay with being interrupted with questions. Yep. So, so in this case, I just iterate through the dependencies in my plugin, and if I delete a line and it still compiles, that's generally healthy. So I delete a, an um, entry. So, so I would. Uh, if I can, you see the GitHub yes. page now? Sure can. Right. Um, so inside here we have the. Let me make this bigger so people can actually read it. Inside here we have the dependency management section. So anything that's in here. Um, for the obviously for the Jenkins version you're targeting so this is for 2.222.1 um, anything in the dependency management section so spot bugs annotations jsip annotations and uh, commons io commons lang anything reported here um, even slf for j um, if it's in this section you can remove it from your pom 
um, you can remove the version from your POM. Um, so if it's in dependency, if it's in dependency management, you can remove it entirely. If it's in dependency, if it's in the dependency section, you can remove the version. So you would still end up with commons codec, commons codec, but you wouldn't have a version specified. Thank does you. That, does that make sense? That did. Thanks very, very much. So, so at minimum, I could get rid of worrying about the version number. Yep. And I may even be able to get rid of explicitly declaring the dependency if it's not required for my com compile. Thanks. Great. Right. Um, so another thing that has changed in plugin port in the plugin POM 4.2 was HTML unit was updated. Um, that was needed to fix the Jenkins test harness. Um, and unfortunately, HTML unit is not backwards compatible. So if you're using web client based tests, you will likely need to kind of fix up the API breakage in your tests. Yeah, it's the kind of classic issue. Every time uh, we upgrade uh, HTML unit, we have to fix binary compatibility. Yeah. Um, so any uh, properties or files um, that you were using? So if you had defined concurrency, so you ran by default with two forks as opposed to one, um, you'll need to change that to fork count. Um, anywhere you've used the um, find bugs properties, you will need to replace those with spot bugs. And if you've got a custom spot bugs uh, excludes filter in your project source, you will need to move that to source spot bugs as opposed to source find bugs. And yeah, James, yep. uh, it looks like uh, your screen froze. Um, or you're oh, just no, your I'm, yeah, I'm sharing the wrong one. Um, right, <laughs> let's go back a bit. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, find bugs and spot bugs. Um, you can just run said on changing the property. Um, the flaky tests. Um, there is no easy way to fix a flaky test or flaky production code. Um, and the first issue is actually being aware that there is flaky tests. Um, you'll pr now probably see them um, more often than not because as soon as the test fails, it will fail the build. Um, if you want to run it locally, just run stuff locally overnight. And if it passes every single time whilst running overnight, then it's probably good enough. Um, easy way to do that if you're running on a Linux or Unix-like operating system and using Bash, um, well, Maven test do done, and that will just loop and run Maven test forever and ever until you either interrupt it or a unit test fails. Um, so uh, I did this earlier this morning, an example of something. Um, so. This was all I needed to do to update um, the Kubernetes credential provider plugin from 3.49 to 4.2. Um, I chose 2.190.1 as the Jenkins baseline I wanted to target, um, mainly because of commercial reasons um, and CloudBees supports um, some older versions than the older LTS. So that's the most, that's the oldest version that CloudBees supports. Um, I removed uh, an override for not uh, rerunning flaky tests because I don't need that anymore because it's it does that automatically. Um, because I'd updated the Jenkins version, um, the SSH credential plugin no longer worked correctly because it couldn't find um, some SSH um, key passing that it needed. Um, so I needed to update that to 1.18.1, .1, which meant I also needed to update the credentials plugin. Um, I no longer needed to um, depend on JUnit. Uh, I no longer needed to include spot bugs annotations. Um, Hamcrest was going to core. And I didn't actually need before to depend on specific Mockito and PowerMock versions, um, but the version of the plugin parent I was depending on had a bug where um, the Mockito and PowerMock weren't compatible at the time I started. Um, so I had that in, so I just took the time to 
remove that. Um, and that was pretty much it for that plugin. There was no source changes I needed to make at all. Um, so what else should I look out for? Um, if you're changing your dependencies, um, it's always good the first time you run it locally is to actually see what is included inside your HPI, so inside your plugin. Um, make sure that there's nothing there that you're not expecting. So for example, when it bundles something, you will get a warning output from the Maven HPI plugin telling you that it is bundling something. Um, so in this case, it's bundling JSON, which comes from the Slack API client. Um, I had a direct dependency on the Slack API client, so that's being bundled, which I also have a dependency, another few direct dependencies. And then there's some transitive dependencies that were being bundled that I may or may not have uh, expected. Um, so in this case, looking at all of those for my plugin was like, that's, that's fine, I'm done. Um, I can release, I can ship it, and I can move on. So, so James, again, forgive my getting an education, but transitive dependencies then, do you generally choose to exclude them if they're being included? How, what's your thought process there? Is that for a separate session that I should delay um, the question? No, no, that's, that's perfectly okay. Um, most likely a transitive dependency. So that's a dependency of something that you depend on. So you may only use an API um, or, or you need an implementation. Say there's an API and an implementation and you depend on the API and the default implementation. And then the default implementation, because it's speaking to some web service, um, will rely on, say, an Apache HTTP client, which is a great one to choose. Um, so that would bundle then the Apache HTTP client in your plugin. Um, lots and lots of plugins depend on the Apache HTTP client. And it's probably not great to have 500 million copies. It's a bit of an exaggeration because we've only got however many plugins we've got in the Jenkins ecosystem. Um, but you know, you don't want 20, 25 versions of the Apache HTTP client uh, in use. And then if someone else depends on your plugin and the Apache HTTP client as well, they're going to get the version of the Apache HTTP client from your plugin, um, which if you don't update it, could be outdated and might not have the library that they need to satisfy their use case. So for the HTTP client use case, there is actually a HTTP client plugin that provides the Apache HTTP client. So in that case, I would uh, exclude the dependency from coming in transitively in my plugin and add a dependency to the Apache HTTP client plugin. Okay, so, so I need to think carefully about those transitive dependencies when I see them. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, transitive dependency is all uh, with the danger and uh, that's why builds of materials are generally useful because it increases your chances of avoiding binary conflict. But if you start suppressing uh, issues and excluding a library in Jenkins is basically a suppressing issue, you're at risk of getting into something. Yeah, and because of where the dependency for Jenkins core comes in, even if, um, say, you're using Commons IO, that should come from Jenkins as opposed to from your plugin. If you bundle it in your plugin, it won't be loaded unless you start using kind of the plugin loader hacks that are out of scope for, for this session. Um, so you will unnecessarily include it. Um, although using the 4.0 POM, it, it will be set to at least the correct version. Um, so it might be that, you know, you, you look at them and go, oh, it's Commons IO. I know that should come from Jenkins, but due to the way that the HPI plugin has seen it, um, it's coming from a closer dependency in my dependency chain than from whatever's requiring it in Jenkins core, it would choose to package it inside your plugin. Um, arguably um, something that's suboptimal in the HPI plugin, um, but also um, it's a little bit out of scope and requires a lot more engineering effort. So if you see something that that's, you know reasonably should be provided by Jenkins and the way to look at that is to go to the Jenkins core bomb. And if it's defined in the Jenkins core bomb, you know it should be coming from Jenkins. 
So at that point, you should probably exclude it. Yeah, it's probably a subject uh, for improvement in maybe an HPI plugin because yep. we can uh, detect uh, these cases automatically. And uh, there is a, was a lot of a lot of groundwork by James, JC, and Daniel uh, to capture these cases. Yeah, we can still do more. We had any more questions? Yeah, so for me, uh, the interesting question is about uh, the extent of a bill of materials. For example, we have components like uh, models, um, which we still do not include uh, into our bill of materials. So what is your opinion about them, James? Uh, does it make sense to include them? Um, I was kind of sitting on the fence on them. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I... I I, to me, um, anything in the bill of materials, I think, should be safe to use and kind of be blessed. Um, and that's where I'm kind of like the core libraries like Commons IO, Commons Lang, um, the things that we've been, um, everyone's been consuming for a while um, are fair game. Some of the more uh, esoteric libraries not so much so, but I can understand the use cases for it. So I'm, I'm not against it. I'm not for it. Um, I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm sat on the fence, as it were. Um, what I think we should probably have is a better thing to say, you're using this, but we really don't think you should be using this. Um, so there's there's probably a, a quite a few libraries that come in from oh, well there's there's obviously like if we look at the spring libraries um probably not the best to be using um we know that people do use them um it might help if you brought up your pull request though like uh, yeah, uh, sure. I was uh, just uh, looking for bunt dependencies and uh, bunt imports to demonstrate your case. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I can just open uh, GitHub Jenkins. Yeah, Jenkins. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't know the and uh, Jenkins core libraries. This one. Yeah. So it it really is. A, I think. A, it, it makes things easier, um, but you know, at the same time, um, the Windows package checker, I don't really think anyone should be dependent on that. Um, probably the same with bcrit. Um, yeah, you could so, clean up this list before merging. Um, but, I, but I understand where you're coming from because it, at the end of the day, that is a bill of materials for Jenkins and that is what Jenkins will bundle and will ship with. So, you know, um, it's... Mm -hmm. Yeah, but still Jenkins has hundreds of dependencies. Uh, some of yeah. them, yeah, we would be happy to get rid of them, but if you get rid of something, basically you remove API and you never yeah. know where it will end. And, and I think that's kind of where I, I'm in my head, this is coming from. So anything that would be an API for Jenkins or be exposed in an API for Jenkins should be managed in the bill of materials. Things that are just things that Jenkins need to be able to run should be outside of the bill of materials and shouldn't even be exposed to plugins. Um, that's where I would like to get to. That's uh, a massive amount of work in itself, which um, you know need need to change the class loaders and things like that, and all the tooling that everyone is used to using. Um, so you know, it's it's not a simple task. It's not a task that anyone has signed up for. Um, there is quite a bit of, um, uh, there's a couple of big JIRAs around it, as well as making the Jenkins test harness use more realistic um, class loading, which would be needed as well if we started having dependencies that Jenkins had, but we didn't want you to consume with your plugin, um, as well as then going, well, 
you built this plugin on the Jenkins before this came in. So actually we want to expose all of these to you. So that was a, that was a long answer for me going, I'm not sure. <laughs> There is definitely a lot of work to be done there, though yep. bill of materials is a great first step because yep. it already prevents a lot of uh, binary compatibility conflicts and binary compatibility conflicts are a big problem for Jenkins users at the moment. Yeah, yep. and it's probably one of the, the biggest reasons why people don't update their Jenkins plugins to the latest Jenkins version or, or a a more modern Jenkins version when they start developing the plugin uh, or when they make make a change. It's because, well, if I do this, I know everything's going to break and I'm going to have to spend 10, 15, 20 minutes going through and fixing the enforcer issues. Um, and I just want to write code. So this should hopefully mean that uh, at, at some point we'll be able to go through and all these plugins that have been detached from core that keep coming back in because you have a, you, you depend on a plugin that depends on an earlier version of Jenkins core, but you don't actually need the detached plugin. Um, that should make it, it simpler. And the less plugins you have in Jenkins, the quicker it is to start up, the less memory it uses. So it all kind of comes around and, and makes Jenkins a, a better place by people moving forward and using a more recent Jenkins. So one question, which is probably, well, I know the answer, but it might be useful for potential viewers, is what is the difference between uh, Jenkins core bill of materials and plugin bill of materials? Yeah, I, I kind of had that on the slide and I really just skimmed over it. Um, so the Jenkins core bill of materials is um, targeted at the libraries that Jenkins provides and runs with. The Jenkins plugin bill of materials is um, about knowing that you can have a set of plugins that you depend on that are all compatible with each other and the version of Jenkins that you are targeting. So if, if you're looking at you, you want to use a version of the, the, the common use cases workflow plugins you need to depend on workflow cps and tesco but you also want to have the workflow step api because you're implementing a step and you're targeting jenkins 2.190 um, you know which, which versions of all of the workflow plugins should you be depending on and so that is where the jenkins plugin bill of materials comes in which is what Jen uh, what oleg is showing now so basically it uh, addresses a similar use case, uh, but uh, for plugin interdependencies, which might be also a, a challenge to maintain. Uh, and, but, I, and another issue, oh, not an issue, another big difference between the Jenkins mm -hmm. core bomb and the, the plugin bomb. The Jenkins core bomb is set in stone at the point in time that Jenkins is released. The plugin bomb is live and is updated as new plugins that are compatible get merged into that. Yes. Uh, so here you can see that uh, there is uh, dependabot. Uh, basically, dependabot uh, picks up all dependency updates and suggests them. Well, usually it fails because uh, there is a lot of uh, integration testing set up uh, here. So when you see a dependency which is not merged, most likely uh, there is some things to be cleaned up before it can actually can uh, go into the bill of materials. But the good news is that uh, this repository does it for you because otherwise you as a plugin maintainer will have had a serious chance of hitting the same issue. And here you get a snapshot where all plugins are cross-tested and uh, at least you can uh, use them with some confidence that they do not conflict to be with each other whether it's a binary conflict or functional conflict, uh, there is some test coverage here. Okay. So are there any other comments or questions? So everybody should be unmuted. And you, if you have a question, you can just ask.
So James is it. So just to, to, for clarity to me, I could potentially use both the Jenkins core bomb to get the, the version numbers that it describes and the plugin bomb? Or Correct. is that, am I choosing one or the other? Um, so when, when you use the um, Jenkins plugin parent uh, version 4.0, you will get the Jenkins bomb. You have no choice in it. Um, it, it is imported. Um, you can then go and import the um, Jenkins plugin bomb yourself in your plugin. Uh, and the two will happily coincide side by side. And now, but there is a Jenkins version number inside or Jenkins version parameter or, or definition for the plugin bomb. But I've also set that in my palm.xml. So should I the, keep those generally the same? They are um, slightly different versions. Okay. Um, so the version when you're um, it, setting the version for the Jenkins core that you target will be um, a full kind of LTS release. Um, for the plugin bomb, it is targeting a line. So you're targeting the 2.164 line or the 2.190 line. Um, so you need to say which artifacts. So thanks, Oleg, for highlighting that. You've got the artifact ID, which is if you were targeting the 2.164 line, you'd say um, your artifact ID is the bomb 2.164. And the version there is the most recent version of that bomb that has been published because it, it will be constantly be updated and published as new plugins are or existing plugins are updated in that um, plugin bomb. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there is a question in the chat from uh, Boris um, about uh, if there is a way, a bomb equivalent uh, when developing a plugin that has front end components as well. Um, not currently. Um, I know if you're trying to do anything on Blue Ocean, that is a particular pain because you need to use the exact same version of everything that Blue Ocean is using to m make it compatible. Um, I'm not aware of any Blue Ocean extensions apart from one proprietary one um, that isn't in the main Blue Ocean tree. Um, I know that Uli Hafner has been working on having kind of a more modern front end for some of the plugins he's using. Um, and he's actually shipping libraries or the JavaScript libraries in plugins and then depending on those plugins. Um, I think there was a talk recently about that. Oleg, is that correct? Uh, there was a blog recently. So if you're interested, yeah, do you see my screen? Uh, so you can't connect to localhost. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I do so a lot of development locally. So yeah, sometimes uh, it becomes a hot hyperlink. Uh, but yeah, here, if you go to the blog, you can see a blog post uh, from uh, Uli, hands-on beautify the user interface of Jenkins reporter plugins. So you can uh, read through this blog post and uh, get uh, all the information. And if you want uh, to see Uli live, actually you have uh, an opportunity uh, for that because next week, again, we have this UI UX hackathon. During this hackathon, we organize a number of sessions uh, for developers and for users. And here you can see that just in one week, uh, Uli will be presenting the same talk during the online uh, Hackfest. And you're welcome to join. Uh, but yeah, in principle, it's uh, a lot about dependency management and how to integrate common components. And hopefully, uh, soon we will be able to provide the bill of materials or a standard framework, which would allow doing it easily. Okay. So, are there any other questions? Probably not. Okay. So
So then, thanks uh, to everyone for your time. Again, it's our first experiment with doing developer meetups in uh, Zoom. So if you have any feedback, uh, we share the feedback form link. We would appreciate any comments and hopefully we'll have uh, more developer meetups. So next week, uh, we will have at least four. Uh, we still haven't decided how we would be hosting that, whether it would be an online meetup or whether we will move forward to another meetup group. Uh, but uh, we plan uh, to do more sessions. And if you would like to join and uh, share your experiences about Jenkins or to provide a uh, show and tell about particular use case, how you develop plugins or how you develop uh, pipelines for what it's worth, uh, please let us know and we will be able to host such event. So thanks a lot to James for this presentation. It uh, was really useful and we will be hosting it on uh, Jenkins YouTube channel soon. So hopefully other uh, plugin maintainers will, will be able to, uh, to see that and uh, update to plugin form for the zero soon. Thank you for organizing yeah. this Oleg. Yeah. Thank you too. So, okay. Any closing comments or feedback uh, before I stop uh, the recording? I guess not. So yeah, thanks all and see you at the next sessions.